Hello, this is Jack Jackson. In this video, we're going to talk a little bit about Carl Gauss, who you see uh, an artist rendering of here as a young man. So to start this, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story about a little boy named Carl. Seven-year-old Carl er entered elementary school, and the teacher asked, um, asked him to sum the integers from 1 to 100. Basically, just trying to keep everybody busy, keep... Uh, Keep, keep them out of out of the teacher's hair. And a Carl, taking no more time than it's taken me to tell this story so far, wrote down the correct sum and turned it in. The teacher said, oh, no, Carl, that's not right. You know, go back and actually do the work. Well, everybody did the work. Carl's the only one that got it right. So how did he do it so fast? Do you have the answer? What is the sum from 1 to 100? Well, how did he do it so fast? Well, what he did is he noticed something here. He noticed that the numbers from 1 to 100 can be grouped in pairs that add up to 101. 1 plus 100 is 101. 2 plus 99, also 101. 3 plus 98, that's also 101, and so on. And so every, every pair of 2, that's 101. There are 100 numbers, so there are 50 pairs. 100 divided by 2 is 50. 50 times 101 is 5,050. So he was able to turn in that number of 5,050 just like that, and he got it correctly. And basically, this technique can be extended to find the sum of any finite arithmetic series. Okay? Well, how do you feel? Do you feel like uh, you've been shown up by a, by a seven-year-old? Well, you shouldn't be too upset if you weren't able to get the answer quite as fast as Carl did. Uh, this seven-year-old was a child prodigy who eventually became possibly the greatest mathematician of all times, and that was Carl Gauss. Now, I want to lift up this story just as an example of showing you how mathematics history can be used to provide an interesting introduction to some topic, in this case to the sum of an arithmetic, uh, spun out arithmetic series. And so this is an example that I've, that I've had teachers do when I was in class, and I've used it in class as well. Uh, it's really not that important if this is actually a true story or not. Um, I've heard that the that the truth of the story is that he was summing a much more difficult arithmetic series uh, and that he was around seven years old or so when he was doing this. I've also heard this might be an apocryphal story, but really it doesn't matter. The thing is, is this is an interesting story that can provide a hook to generate uh, s some interest in a subject. So think, this is one of the many ways that you could use mathematics history in the teaching of mathematics. But in any event, uh, this is, whether it was true or not, this is definitely something that very much could have happened because Carl Gauss was an actual child prodigy. He was born in, in uh, April 30th, 1777 and died February 23rd, 1855. Um, and he was a child prodigy. He was able to correct mistakes in his father's bookkeeping at an extremely early age, well before seven, uh, perhaps before he can even, uh, you know, even walk around real well. He was he was so young. Um, so can you imagine this toddler going around that could do advanced calculations, uh, you know, well, arithmetic, doing it very quickly? Um, he was German. And unlike a lot of other mathematicians, he didn't travel. Uh, he actually never left Germany. Uh, but he is recognized as one of, if not the greatest mathematician of all times. He's sometimes given the title Prince of Mathematics. He was not nobility. He wasn't an actual prince, but, but in mathematics, he was. Um, notice that he was alive in the last part of the uh, 18th century, and so he is properly a mathematician of the 18th century as well. Uh, but and he was a he was a uh, not only as a child prodigy, he actually did and published some important works in the latter part of the 18th century. But then, of course, he uh, by the time the start of the 19th century had come along, he was uh, a leader in mathematics. Of course, uh, you know with the Bernoullis and Euler. You had mathematical centers in Berlin, Basel, uh, and the Netherlands, and also New Amsterdam, and also in, in St. Petersburg in Russia. 
and those all those places became uh, centers of mathematics, especially in the early part of the 18th century. The latter part of the 18th century, uh, the, the mathematicians in Paris with folks like uh, Legendre and Lagrange and and various other ones that were there in in uh, F- Paris and, and in France at at uh, during the French Revolution uh, became sort of the main center of mathematics. But with Gauss, uh, you know, Germany once again becomes a really major center, especially at Göttingen, where he he worked for many 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 years. At the age of 19, he uh, made a very uh, advanced proof in uh, Euclidean geometry. He found a compass and straight edge construction of a regular 17 gon. Now, constructions of rather regular polygons with sides of multiples of 2, 3, and 5 had been found, uh, but not other ones. And this one of a regular 17 gon really was the most advanced uh, um, expansion of, of traditional uh, Euclidean type geometry made out of constructions definitely that had been happened since since the time of, of some of the ancient Greeks. Uh, so this was a, a big deal and he was very proud of this discovery. He was so proud of it that he wanted it on his tombstone. So obviously consider this one of his greatest discoveries throughout his life. Uh, unfortunately, the, the person who made his tombstone said that, well, that just looked too much like a circle and refused to do it, but it did appear on a monument that is uh, made to him. Um, after studying some at the sort of the pre, pre-collegiate level, he went to Göttingen where he studied in college. He became friends there with Farkas Belay, and we'll talk more about Belay and his son uh, as when we get to some work talking more about uh, the the development of hyperbolic geometry and non-Euclidean geometry. His dissertation was written in 1799, uh, where he had moved from Göttingen to the University of Helmstedt. That's where he got his doctorate. And uh, he proved the fundamental theorem of algebra in that, um, that doctorate. So that's a, a very major result in algebra, which basically says that if you have a polynomial uh, with real coefficients, they can be it can be always factored uh, into linear and quadratic factors with real coefficients. So that's the fundamental theorem of algebra. Hence, the name "fundamental theorem of algebra" is, is uh, you know, says something about its fundamental place in algebra, right? Its importance. So he did that. Uh, you know, I guess I guess he was around 22 when he when he published that uh, very major work in 1801. A few years, a couple of years later. He published a major work on number theory, and in that he he included a chapter on his 17 gone proof that he had uh, proved uh, a few years earlier when he was 19. Um, but there were some major works on number theory there. And in fact, in terms of his influence, well, I don't know. There were so many things that he did, but number theory was definitely among some of his most important work. The dwarf planet or asteroid uh, series was seen in 1801, but it was lost as it moved behind the sun, and and they didn't get enough measurements to predict where it was going to be. And so so the uh, astronomers were trying to find where is it going to end up, and Gauss was able to uh, predict exactly where to find it. In fact, several people put in estimates, and Gauss's was was way different than the rest, and he was dead on exactly where to find it when we come out from behind the sun, when it would come there, and where it would be. And one of the things that he applied was a method of least squares regression that he had worked on uh, to work on that. In 1807, Gauss became the director of the Göttingen Observatory, and most of his income and from his life was as an astronomer or observatory director. And he particularly liked this position because it didn't require him to teach. He really just hated teaching. He he apparently only went to one scientific conference. He liked to pretty much work on his own. He he did take on a few advanced doctoral students. In fact, some of them were amazing. Uh, he, he taught Dirichlet and Riemann, among others. And um, so he did, he did pass on his knowledge directly to some students. Uh, but not many. Uh, he did not like to, to lecture in the classroom. And eight in uh, no, not 
1089. So in 1809, he published his second book, which is on the motion of celestial bodies. He was married twice. His, his first wife uh, dialed died in childbirth when they, her second son was born. His second son died right after that. He married her best friend a few years later, and they ended up having three more children. He published on a wide variety of subjects. Uh, we've already mentioned number theory, and in that he did modular arithmetic, so uh, he was one of the first to to really bring that forward, and especially using our modern notation of like, like uh, n is congruent to you know three mod seven, that sort of thing that you may have seen in your uh, abstract algebra classes, or perhaps in in uh, maybe you saw that in abstract algebra, or possibly foundations of math or discrete math class. He did some work with what are called the Gaussian integers, quadratic re reciprocity related to modular arithmetic. Um, he did some work on geometry. We've already mentioned the 17-gon construction, but he did some work on differential geometry, differential equations, hypergeometric functions. He actually introduced hypergeometric functions. And he did some work on statistics, statistical estimators. The normal distribution is sometimes called the Gaussian distribution after him, the bell-shaped curve that's so important to the theory of uh, probability and statistics. He worked on the least squares regression, which is a big, important thing in statistics. Uh, he worked on mathematical physics, celestial mechanics, magnetism. He published on all of these areas, and the things that he published were, you know, first rate. They were among the top papers in the field on all of these things. He did some, he was working on some survey type things, so he invented the heliotrope as an instrument for that. And he worked on many areas that he did not publish. For example, um, he claims to have developed non-Euclidean geometry, essentially hyperbolic geometry, uh, before anyone else, but he didn't publish it. And many of his results were actually found in his papers and published after his death. Had he actually published all the results as he found them, mathematics would advance much further. Some, some estimates said he could have advanced advanced the, the, uh, the growth of mathematics overall by, by at least 50 years had he published everything as he got to them. Um, but he didn't do that. He did collaborate for a while with some folks. Uh, one of them was Wilhelm Weber, who he worked on electricity and magnetism. Here's a couple uh, artist renderings. Here's a, a drawing of, of Gauss in the foreground, Weber in the background, and uh, a statue that has them together. Uh, he corresponded with some mathematicians, uh, most notably Sophie Germain. Uh, she made some of the most important advances in number theory along with, uh, with Gauss. And uh, she was an, another important mathematician of this time. And Gauss was really the master of all the mathematics of his day. And he was probably the last person of which this can be said. After Gauss, mathematics had grown to the point to where it was really too big for any one particular mathematician to really understand all of mathematics. Uh, but what's interesting is, is he didn't publish much. His motto was few but ripe. That's the English translation of it, few but ripe. So by that, what did he mean? Well, he meant that he only published things when they met his own extremely high standards of rigor. He was also af afraid to publish anything that he thought might be controversial, like the hyperbolic geometry. He didn't think the world was quite ready for that. But it is interesting that he did rec he kept a diary, and the diary he recorded uh, some of the mathematics that he uh, developed. And that diary, uh, eventually, uh, his his heirs have now put it in, uh, in a library where where it can be studied by math historians. And one of the things that we could do with that is use it, because of the dates and so forth in it, to verify some of his claims of priority. So what would happen sometimes is a mathematician would come see Gauss, who by this time, of course, was, was very much known and had a reputation as being, you know, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, mathematician on the planet at the time, and he was. They would come into him with some of their their uh, 
earth-shattering new discoveries, and he said, yep, yeah, done that. I bet I already did that. That's something I did five, ten years ago. Which, of course, I guess maybe makes him a jerk, makes, makes him arrogant. Uh, but, of course, is it really arrogance if you if you uh, really are that smart? Yeah, probably it still is. Uh, but any event, um, he would do these things, and, of course, the diary... Uh, allows us to verify that that some of these things actually happen. It had been anybody other than Gal, you'd say, yeah, he's just, you know, he's just making up stuff. If he really knew those things, he would have let people know. But that really wasn't his style. Uh, so a lot of things that he knew uh, didn't get published. So actually, you know, he was actually a lot smarter even than the people of his day actually knew. So uh, he was kind of like Newton in that represent re in that respect that he uh, didn't publish a lot of the things that he uh, had developed. You know, very much contrast to, say, Euler, who just published, published, published all over the place. And so probably he had a lot less influence on the history of mathematics than he might have had. But his standards for rigor and his work in all these different areas of mathematics really helped propel the, the age forward with the age of rigor and helped kind of set the standard that, uh, that other mathematicians of the day started trying to reach and work toward. So that's a brief introduction to uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss, who was undoubtedly one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, perhaps the greatest mathematician. I don't know how you can, it's that, that, that title is, you know, somewhat meaningless because how can you compare, say, Archimedes to Gauss when they have completely different uh, situations, completely different uh, amounts of mathematics that was known beforehand. But uh, he certainly, under anybody's estimation, rates at least among the best.